Okay, last time we left off, um, we were doing a uh, pairwise correlation test, and uh, we were looking at statistically uh, significant results. So um, if you remember, we wanted to compare Major League Baseball player salaries, the 50th richest person in Major League Baseball from 1995 to 2012 versus the autism rates for those respective years. Um, so what are we comparing? We're comparing these numbers versus these numbers. So we have these two columns of data. The first thing we had to do was ask ourselves, are these data normally distributed or not? If either column is not, then we have to use Spearman correlation. If they're both normal, then we can use Pearson correlation. So we check to see are the cor uh, columns normal. So S. Wilk, salary 50th, autism 1000, so that was the name of those variables. We see salary 50th, not, not uh, statistically different from normal. So high p-values in this case, they indicate the data are normally distributed. High p-values here, again, indicate the data are normally distributed, not significantly different from normal. So um, we can go ahead and use the Pearson correlation test. Now, when we use the Pearson correlation test, um, if we want the uh, significance value, we use PW core autism 1000, which is our first variable that we want to use, then salary 50th, which is our second variable, and then we put comma sig for significant or not. So it does the correlation test. As you see, autism is perfectly correlated with the same variable as you would expect. X is correlated with X, or Y is correlated with Y. But salary 50th versus autism, we see almost a perfect correlation of 0 0.9792. 1.000 is a perfect correlation. So we get the p-value here of 0 0.0006, which is definitely statistically significant. So again, you can see these correlation coefficients when you're comparing the same variable, salary 50th, for salary 50th, they're going, that's going to be perfect. Autism versus autism, that's going to be a perfect correlation. So that's what that footnote's about down there on the end. Um, it doesn't provide p-values for those because there's no need to. Um, but here, you know, this is what we're interested in. Strong correlation, and it is a statistically significant strong correlation. So we have a nearly perfect correlation for our interpretation with a Pearson correlation coefficient of 0.98 between the autism rate per 1,000 people and the Major League Baseball salary of the 50th top paid person for each year of study. And that is statistically significant since P is 0 0.006, which is less than our alpha value of 0 0.05. Now, it is possible that you can have very high, very high correlation coefficients, but if you have small sample sizes or a lot of error, you can still have a statistically insignificant result, which pretty much renders the whole correlation insignificant. So you can still have high correlation coefficients and they not be significant, but generally higher correlations, higher correlation coefficients, higher sample sizes tend to result in more statistically significant results. So that was kind of the end of the first section on this. So we're gonna move into the second part which is applying the Pearson and Spearman correlations. And then um, we're also going to be moving into using scatter plots here into the future. So um, if you want to uh, compare, remember our previous method where we were comparing maybe E. coli versus other methods? Well, maybe you want to see whether or not something that's rapid, like measuring turbidity, the water clarity. Because you can measure water clarity instantly. But if you're in the village or in the field or in the military, you need to know something about water quality. Um, you don't may you may don't may not have 24 hours to wait for an incubator or 48 hours. So if we want to know: Can we predict water more quickly using turbidity? So we want to see: Can we see if if the turbidity value is first correlated with Coley plate? So is this correlated with that? So now you have data from our Canyon Water Study, 800 some up samples. 
We have E. coli values, turbidity values, a lot of E. coli values, a lot of turbidity values, um, hundreds of them. So we want to see are the E. coli data correlated with turbidity. So first, are the columns normal? So we do a Shapiro Wilk test, 829 E. coli observations, low, low, low p value, turbidity, 818 observations, all of them um, together suggest big departures from normality. So the columns are not normal. We cannot use Pearson. We have to use a different type of correlation. So we do the Spearman correlation test. That's what we're going to have to do because these p-values on the normality test suggest the data are significantly different from normal. So we have to conclude that they're not normal or non-parametric, and this is our alternative test um, to the Pearson correlation. So we have to use Spearman. So we use the Spearman correlation test, so we put in the, the command Spearman, then the variables, you can put turbidity or E. coli first. In this case, Spearman, the variable turbidity, the variable E. coli, that's the command, and you hit enter. There are 813 pairs of data. We get a correlation coefficient of negative 0.05. So that means as turbidity goes up, E. coli goes down a little slightly. Not exactly what we would expect. And the correlation coefficient is really close to zero. So it's almost like if there is a correlation there, it's pretty weak. And they would call it an inverse or negative correlation if it's there. Now the question is, is, is this correlation a statistically significant one or not? And in this case, it says that, uh, that no, turbidity and E. coli have a p-value of 0.13 for the Spearman test. So for, for interpretation, I would say that this correlation coefficient, negative 0.0525, is not statistically significant because the p-value of 0.13 is greater than 0.05. So here's the interpretation. The Spearman row value of negative 0.05 was not statistically significant because p was 0.13, which is greater than our alpha value of 0.05. Therefore, we have insufficient evidence to believe turbidity is associated or correlated with our E. coli data using this data set. So the turbidity um, would not probably be a good indicator of E. coli. You will see correlation coefficients used routinely in the literature. So here are Spearman correlation coefficients showing the relationship between a new pathogen called Arcobacter at the uh, Euclid and Villa Angela beaches with a human specific fecal marker. So you see that the human fecal marker and this bacteria Arcobacter have a correlation of 0.60, which is pretty strong, statistically significant. An antibiotic resistance gene marker is statistically significant. As the Arcobacter pathogen goes up, so did these. These are positive correlations. But with water temperature, as water temperature went up, Arcobacter went down. As turbidity went up, the number below it, you see the number below it, 0.278. As the uh, turbidity goes up, so does Arcobacter. A little weaker correlate, a lot weaker correlation than this human marker, but turbidity was correlated. You see all the p-values there. That's significant. That's significant. That's significant. You see maybe different effects or similar effects at different beaches. These are two beaches here. This is water quality from these two beaches. These things were not significant at those beaches, so the authors left those out. When you put all the beaches together, all the study results, you can see, again, similar results, similar findings. Um, so uh, is Spearman correlation coefficients. You'll see uh, more. This is looking at a uh, study of particles and health in Atlanta using this SOFIA study was what it was called. And they were comparing, uh, you can see PM10 is obviously perfectly correlated with itself, but PM10, 0.59, and ozone. Now, it doesn't show here which ones are statistically significant. I can't, can't tell. Maybe they're all statistically significant. 
Um, but you can see all the ones I wish follow, kind of this pattern as you're comparing ozone versus ozone, nitrogen dioxide versus itself. But you can see carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide have a correlation of 0 0.70. PM25, water, solids, and metals, or whatever that is, that method, and PM10, strong correlation there, 0 0.73. So you see this stuff in the literature. So we're going to do a familiar practical example. Remember before we did a paired t-test comparing Lexington air quality monitors to Richmond air quality monitors? Say the state's maintaining an air quality monitor in Lexington and one in Richmond, and they want to take the one in Richmond offline. We talked about doing a paired t-test earlier, so now we can do a correlation test. So are the Richmond and Lexington air monitors producing similar results or correlated results? So remember we can use stata for the correlation test. We don't want them in columns like this. We need them to be paired like this. Richmond data, Lexington data, they're paired. We're going to compare this versus this, this versus this, this versus this, and so forth. So are the columns normally distributed, yes or no? So we kind of take our Richmond data, we take our Lexington data, and we do our normality test. So Shapiro, Wilk, Richmond, Lexington, we get our p-values. Both of them are well above 0.05, so we are happy to say, yes, the columns meet the normal assumption. They are statistically similar to normality. They are not different. So let's go on. So since both are normal, we can do a Pearson correlation test. So we do PW core, Richmond, Lexington, comma, SIG. Again, we see a very high correlation coefficient of 0.9356 and a p-value of 0 0.0000, which would be called 0 0.0001, less than 0 0.0001. So we can say this nearly perfect up here, 0.9 to 1, this nearly perfect Pearson correlation coefficient of 0.94 is statistically significant since P was less than 0 0.001, which is definitely less than an alpha value of 0 0.05. Therefore, we can conclude that the Lexington Air Monitor and Rich, Richmond Air Monitor are very strongly correlated. Now, if you're curious about the Spearman test, you can do that too, and we can see the Spearman Richmond Lexington results. And you see a very high correlation coefficient again, and you see that it's also statistically significant. Now, you wouldn't need to do this because the data were normal, but if you did, um, you would see similar results. Um, and it doesn't matter the order, you know, you do them in, but you can see if we were to rank them from lowest to highest, um, we're going to get the same results using the rankings rather than the numbers because the Spearman correlation test is based on their ranks. So if you do a Pearson correlation of rich rank and Lexington rank, you get the exact same numbers. How does it work? We can sort our Richmond data and code them as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We can sort our similar Lexington data and when you put the um, numbers as assigned to each of these, when we do these rankings, we're not using these numbers here. We're using the ranks. So you're essentially doing the Pearson correlation of the rankings rather than these numbers. So it's really just a correlation of the rankings rather than a correlation of the actual true numbers. So that's how it works. So if we do Spearman and get 0.9163, um, you know, that's obviously different than our Richmond-Lexington data when we do the Pearson correlation. But if we do the Pearson correlation, if we go back and do it on the rankings, the Pearson correlation on the rankings, you can see that 0.916 that we had for Spearman. So that's how Spearman works. It's just a Pearson correlation using the ranked data rather than using the actual numbers. So that's how Spearman correlation works, if you're curious. But again, Spearman, it's used for data that are not normally distributed. It uses the ranks, and Pearson uses the actual numbers and is um, more likely to give you some headaches if you're using it for data that are not normally distributed because uh, outliers can have a lot, of, a lot of influence. So that ends part two of the application of Pearson and Spearman correlations. And um, maybe I'll do a video here in the future on scatter plots um, when we get to linear regression. 
All right, that's it. Thank you.